What is common between North Korean President Kim Jong Un, Russian President Vladimir Putin, President of China Xi Jinping, Prime Minister of Italy Georgia Meloni, and Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban? I mean, apart from that, they are all politicians. What if I add Jordan Peterson and Elon Musk to the mix? What is common between them all? Well, all of them want women to have more children. We all saw Kim Jong Un crying in a speech urging women to have more children. Vladimir Putin has urged Russian women to have eight or more children while the war with Ukraine goes on. President Xi has made similar appeals to Chinese women. Businessinsider.com had a full article on the subject called The World's Most Powerful Men Want Women to Have More Babies. This is also the basis of the article published on populationconnection.org this week, How the Spread of Conservative Pronatalism Threatens Women's Hard-Won Rights. It also refers to UN report, which talks about change in percentage of countries which are having policies to either raise or lower fertility of their populations. This chart shows year on the horizontal axis and percentage of countries on the vertical axis. The orange line shows percentage of countries who had policies to lower the fertility of their population, that is, they had anti rate list policies. Blue line shows the percentage of countries who had policies to raise fertility, that is, pro-net list policies. As you can see, in 1976, 27% of countries in the world had anti net list policies, whereas only 9% had pro net list policies. In 1986, 33% had policies to decrease fertility and 12% were trying to increase the fertility. anti net list policies peaked in 1996 with 42% of countries, while pro net list countries steadily rose to 14%. By 2019, the anti net list policies had reduced to 35% and net list policies had risen to 28%. These countries with pro net list policies tend to view women as a means to produce more children and large families. This includes the politicians and the influencers like these. The article points out that it is obvious that those most alarmed about the trend towards smaller families wish to maintain the power structures that place them at the top of the food chain. Conservative pro lists would like women to return to traditional submissive domestic roles and produce more bodies for the military, more voters for their party and more consumers and taxpayers for the economy. It is no coincidence that crackdowns on abortion rights often go hand in hand with underpopulation concerns. But there is some good news. The trend of dinks, which is double income no kids, is on the rise. Palki Sharma of Vantage Point, a channel which has more than 3 million subscribers, did a whole video on why dinks are all over and even in rural India. Her point was having children is getting more expensive. So the choice to not have children is becoming financially intelligent. This was so much the case that she titled her video, How are Dings winning the economy? The cost of having children is not just in financial terms. The wealthier the country is, the more opportunities it offers to give meaning to your life. Having children would then mean having to sacrifice those opportunities. That opportunity cost is also behind the ding phenomenon, according to this article on Quillette.com, Misunderstanding the Fertility Crisis. It says that dink is a cultural response to the fact that it's never been more expensive to have children when all the costs are considered. Dink or child-free by choice are different to antinatalism. Under the broad non-procreative umbrella, Child-free is a lifestyle stemming from personal reasons like financial situation, career, freedom, travel, etc. anti natalism on the other hand, is a philosophy. This distinction gets blurred when the topic of anti natalism is picked up by large channels or mainstream media. That happened when Soch by Mohak Mangal, a channel having almost 3 million subscribers, made a video called Why Rich Indians Don't Want Babies. The video has more than 800,000 views in 8 days. This video wrongly claimed that antinatalism stems from environmental concerns and also mixes it with dink or child-free lifestyles. This was done by editing clips of interview of a vegan and an ethical antinatalist YouTuber, Maddie Coco. Fortunately, Maddie Coco had the recording of his full interview and has posted it on his own channel. 
he clearly explains that he is anti-natalist for the risk and consent arguments. He answers almost all questions from ethical anti-natalist's perspective, which I urge everybody to watch. There was only one question I would have answered differently. Another thing is like, this is quite a recent trend that you can see, like, right? Not many people in our previous generation, not many people in our uh, parents' generation. Just today I was talking to my mom and I was talking about uh, antinatalism and she's like, what, what is this? What is this new fad that you've got? So, um, so it's quite a recent trend. Why do you think this is happening? Antinatalism is not a recent concept at all. One could say that more people know about it now than any time in the past thanks to internet. But the concept has existed since ancient times. There have been antinatalistic themes in Hindu and Buddhist literature. References to antinatalism also exist in Christianity. Abu al-Mari was 10th century poet who is said to have been antinatalist. Schopenhauer in 19th century writes with what can be argued as antinatalist positions. Samuel Beckett has quotes aligning with antinatalism. Gandhi has said antinatalist things and I've made a video on Gandhi's antinatalist thinking. Even modern antinatalism like David Benatar's Asymmetry is now almost 20 years old since its publication in Life, Death and Meaning. So no, antinatalism is not a recent concept. Anyway, it is important to note that advantages of child freedom or a reduced carbon footprint are added benefits and not reasons behind ethical antinatalism. A person can save good money by not buying large amounts of alcohol over the years. But the real reason to abstain from drinking is that person's suffering and well-being. The reasons for antinatalism are the arguments why it is a harm to come into sentient existence, as well as the implication of why we should not further impose that harm onto others. Listverse.com published 10 reasons for antinatalism. Starting with consent argument on number 10, referring to Sam Wolf's comprehensive analysis on this topic. At number 9 is the suffering, which is an integral part of being alive. Although the article does a good job of including psychological suffering along with the physical suffering, it seems to be focused only on human animals without mentioning that other animals also suffer. Bad things are worse than good things are pleasant. This asymmetry between good and bad things in life is true, but it is separate than Benatar's axiological asymmetry. Parents gamble with your life. This is partly a risk argument and partly the consent argument. Here the article refers to Mati's entry about risks and precautions in the Journal of Medical Ethics, BMJ. We all die in the end. The article says that being dead may not be bad, but the process of dying is almost always a horrible experience. This is not entirely true. For example, David Benatar thinks that life is bad, but so is death. Religion suggests non-existence is better. It refers to quotes from Bible and Buddhist literature having antinatalist thoughts. Antinatalism in religion is a subject of deeper study and exploring it is certainly valuable in the archaeological sense. Suicide is painful. That is definitely true and it quotes Benatar. It is possible to think both that coming into existence is a serious harm and that death is usually a serious harm. Indeed, some people might think that coming into existence is a serious harm in part because the harm of death is then inevitable. Existence is worse than non-existence. Even though Sophocles and Epicurus are quoted here, I thought Benatar's axiological asymmetry would have been a perfect fit to mention as it points out the harms of coming into existence. Humans are pretty terrible to the world, explaining the environmental damage by humanity and impact on other species rather than on other individual animals. And finally, humans are pretty terrible to each other. This is the misanthropic argument proper, explaining how humans harm each other and other individual animals also. All in all, a great list of reasons for antinatalism. If I have to put a finger on something, it felt like the list focused only on human animals. Effective accelerationism is a philosophical movement for accelerating technological progress. It is based on the belief that this technological progress should be accelerated at all costs and that is the only justifiable course of action. This leads to artificial intelligence and artificial general intelligence development to the point where questions of artificial sentient existence start to appear along with technological evolution interacting with aspects of human and non-human extinction. 
The article Unpicking Extinction reviews different viewpoints about extinction starting with effective accelerationism. We usually think of extinction as mere disappearance of a species that exists today or have existed in the past. But there are many variants to this. For example, if we talk about human extinction, does it mean there would be no humans left? Or does it mean humans evolve into intelligent machines or intelligent machines cause human extinction to take over the world? Even in simpler cases of humans disappearing, does it mean destruction of everything that humans have built so far? Or does it mean disappearance of just human bodies as we know them today? This crosses over with antinatalism in two ways. One of the theoretical consequences of antinatalism could be extinction. Antinatalists then have to deal with the goodness or badness of the process of extinction and of goodness and badness of being extinct in and of itself. Secondly, sentiocentric antinatalists also have to deal with the possibility of sentient inorganic machines in the future. Apart from that, the timing of extinction, the urgency of question altogether and its overlaps with other suffering focused movements, as well as its conflicts with the movements which have something else rather than suffering as a central belief are the aspects serious antinatalists have to deal with. In that context, this article was very informative and entertaining. JP Reacts is a channel with almost 500,000 subscribers. He made a video criticizing Stop Having Kids organization and antinatalism. Both Lawrence and Stop Having Kids have made a response video to it. I am not going to react to it, but I'll just leave his main arguments here for you to see their depth. Have you seen these billboards? One of the most obvious expressions of evil that I have ever seen. Evil, devil, evil, 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 satanic website. Stophavingkids.org. Creepy, anti-human organization. We hate humans, we hate ourselves, and we're propagating evil. Evil forces, devil, kill humanity. Evil, satanic, stupid. Evil, devil, devil, satanist. Evil, satan, satanic, demented psycho. Evil, atrocious stupid videos evil behind it 